some great journalists. Um, thank you all for joining us um, on this uh, sort of very last minute planned press conference um, by the Syrian Emergency Task Force and Ridgely Walsh, who helped organize this, um, to discuss the latest uh, announcement of sanctions uh, and maybe go a little bit further onto why these places were sanctioned, um, these intelligence branches and prisons and individuals in Syria, um, what that means and what more needs to be done. My name is Muaz Mustafa. I am the executive director of the Syrian Emergency Task Force, and I am honored to be joined today by a distinguished panel, um, including Ambassador Stephen Rapp, the former US War Crimes Ambassador and Advisory Board Member of the Syrian Emergency Task Force, chairs the board of the of, of CIJA, um, and uh, as well as uh, working with the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, uh, pursuing accountability and justice on behalf of Syrians uh, for all the war crimes um, that have been committed and continue to be committed in Syria. Um, thank you for joining us. We also have uh, Sam Goodwin, who is um, has an amazing story. Uh, Sam uh, currently is pursuing his graduate degree at the Was at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, he is a former detainee um, of the Assad regime, uh, including uh, one of uh, including one of the branches that are that have been recently sanctioned, and we'll hear from him, <clears throat> as well as Omar Al Shugri, who is the director of detainee affairs at the Syrian Emergency Task Force, currently studying at Georgetown University. Um, Omar is a former detainee of multiple branches that have been recently sanctioned um, uh, by the US yeah. Treasury, uh, including Saidnaya and Branch 215, um, another branch that also uh, Sam Goodwin was held in. Um, and so I, I wanted to welcome you all. And, and before we get started, just <clears throat> send a quick reminder of what's unfolding in Syria today. Outside of the hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children and elderly that are being currently tortured, starved, emaciated by the Assad regime uh, in, in its different intelligence branches, uh, an ongoing really never again moment going on in these horrific dungeons. Um, in Idlib province in Northwest, where we are on a school for orphans and a women's center and bakeries, uh, where 4 million civilians, a million of them children are in an ever shrinking space. Um, uh, currently, we are seeing an escalation of the bombardment by the Russians, Iranians, Assad regime, and allied militias against these civilians, targeting residential areas, hospitals, and schools. And we have seen an escalation in this violence. Uh, you can all follow that on, uh, on our app called Syria Watch, two words, Syria Watch on Android and iPhone. And that gives you a notification every time there's an attack against civilians. And there is uh, really big fears um, from those watching um, that there will be a major escalation of the violence in Northwest Syria that can lead to mass atrocities, mass displacement, and more detentions into these horrific dungeons. And finally, in the South, in Dara, we have a, a siege that's been going on for 30 days. The Assad regime has sent troops and military equipment down to Dara, the town where the city where the revolution has begun. Um, and they are currently conducting attacks against civilians. I uh, just heard uh, a, a few minutes ago that six people were killed uh, by a missile sent by the Assad regime. There has been threats uh, by the Assad regime of sending in Hezbollah and other uh, Iranian-backed militias in addition to the regime's uh, uh, military uh, that's already there. Uh, and that's a situation that must be resolved um, as many civilian lives are, are in danger. And many are in danger, not just of death, but also detention into these horrific branches. Um, but with that, I wanted to say that, you know, the Syrian Emergency Task Force um, is, is pleased to finally see some sanctions being levied against these war criminals. Um, the first of their kind since President Biden's administration has taken power. And that gives us hope um, that this is a positive step in the right direction that can ho hopefully lead to a more serious and complete serious strategy that, that can help lead us to the negotiated settlement that we all seek. And that pulls away the military solution away from the Assad regime, Iran and Russia. And with that, I wanna turn it over to my colleague, um, Mr. Omar al Shogri, who can maybe um, give us an idea of what was sanctioned, why is that significant and anything else you'd like to add? So please, Omar. 
Thank you, Moaz. In advance, I want to thank you for your patience on the noises behind me. I'm at the airport, and I hope one day I can, you know, be at the airport to travel to Syria. Um, so now, finally, after after years, I can actually reach out or answer to the families, the Syrian families, the, the families, the detainees who their kids being tortured or still in prison, and those who lost their kids in prison. I can answer their messages saying them, well, the new government, the U.S. government that we thought may not act is acting now. There's sanctions on the people who uh, actually were responsible for killing your children, for detaining them, for starving them for so long time. I can tell my mom, my mom, just can you just go to my mom and tell her, look, those guys who, who were responsible for torturing me, those who were responsible for, for for killing my father and my brothers, those are now being followed by a, one of the greatest nations in the world, by United States of America. So I'm very pleased and very, very great to hear, to hear this news, but the new sanctions, um, the, the, the US Treasury Department has sanctioned um, seven different prisons of Assad, um, of Assad prison, including Saidna prison 215 and branch 248, which I spent a long time in. I spent one year, nine months in Branch 215. I spent one year, almost one year inside Naya and a few days in 248. And Sam, good one, he can speak for himself very soon. He spent some time in 215 and he knows the brutality of this prison and how much people die on a daily basis and knows that there is so much evidence, including the Caesar photos that commence the war crimes. And it shows you in numbers and in faces and bodies how many people died in this prison. It shows you how much we actually have evidence that the Ambassador Rapp can mention later, uh, how strong and how confirmed it that by, by, by the US, uh, by, by the FBI. Um, so for the same people, this news is really important, sanctioning those prison and prisons and sanctioning those individuals who run those prisons, who give order to the torture, uh, will hopefully bring some um, a prevention, I would say, to, to more people being part of this death machine. Because on a daily basis, there is recruitment to those prisons. There's guards and new guards coming because the regime is smart enough to kill those head of prisons on a regular basis. But if we either put more, put more pressure on the regime by these sanctions, hopefully we can prevent more people uh, from being part of this death machine. Thank you, Moaz. Um, one one quick question, Omar, before we move on to Sam and then Ambassador Rapp, I, I wanted to maybe give uh, people an understanding of what is the effect of, of these things that happen sometimes in the West or in different governments, whether they're sanctions, whether they're hearings, whether they're raising awareness. How does that affect prisoners that are right now in these horrific dungeons, whether it's a mother and her baby that was born in prison, whether it's an elderly man or a young woman or, or a child? Yes. Is there an effect that, that is felt by them when these acts are taken outside the country? And what's the significance of that? Absolutely. I remember when I was in prison, um, when you starve, when you tortured, your dream is to not be tortured and to, to, to get some food. And during my time in prison, suddenly there was a, almost a month of less torture, more food, and you get really surprised. You don't know what's going on in the world. And when I was finally smuggled, get out of prison, I tried to go back in, in time and look in the media, what happened at that specific month of that year that made the guard like, torture me less and give me more food. And that was when the Caesar photos was released and everybody around the world was talking about them. That was the impact of that was the impact of social media, the impact of people talking about it, the impact of governments putting pressure on the Syrian regime. That pressure automatically, you know, put some pressure on the guards who are working in those prisons. So there is there is a serious value because remember, always remember, those prisoners dream of having enough water because so many prisoners are dying because of lack of water. So many prisoners are dying because of the torture. If you know, if you limit the torture for one week, you save so many lives. And we can do that by releasing and by imposing such sanctions on the same regime. Thank you very much, Omar, uh, for that. And now we move on to uh, Mr. Sam Goodwin, um, who can give us an idea of what branch 215 is, one of these branches that have uh, now been sanctioned by President Biden's administration um, and his thoughts uh, in general over what's unfolding in Syria and U.S. policy. Please, Sam. Yeah, thanks, Moss. Thanks, uh, Omar, Ambassador Rapp, and, and everyone who 
uh, is taking a few minutes out of the Thursday to, to be with us right now. Uh, my name is Sam Goodwin. I was detained on false charges in Syria in 2019. I was held for nine weeks, uh, the first 27 days of which I was held in Syria's military intelligence prison, uh, branch number 215, which, uh, as we mentioned, is one of the eight Assad-run detention centers that was officially sanctioned by the U.S. Treasury yesterday. And during this time, I never uh, saw another inmate, but the facility was not soundproof. And every day I would hear the sounds of brutal beatings and torture happening in the neighboring cells just just around me. And you know, maybe it was uh, my passport that saved me from torture. Maybe it was uh, keeping you know, the opportunity of me potentially being released. I don't know what it was for sure, but what I do know is that um, I couldn't be more grateful. And I think I speak for Omar as well. I just couldn't be more grateful that I found myself in one of these dungeons and emerged, uh, emerged alive. And uh, as many of us here know, um, what's happening today with, with the treasury and the sanctions is, is very closely linked to the Caesar law. And this conflict in Syria has been going on for 11 years and in just two years and only in Damascus, the the former Syrian military photographer who later defected with code name Caesar documented more than 55,000 cases of men, women, children, and elderly being tortured to death in these facilities. And so I think that what's happening today is just is super important, and, and it's it's a pleasure to be involved. And, and I'm I'm grateful to all of you for for taking some time out of your day to to hear uh, to hear about this and learn more about it. Sam, I, I wonder before I move on to Ambassador Rab, just to quickly give an idea of the type of people that are being held in these prisons. Um, like who are they, uh, and 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 who the regime sort of puts in with these hundreds of thousands. And, and number two, um, you know, I think um, just describing a little bit of what did you hear being perpetrated against these Syrian civilians during your solitary confinement in, in this horrific dungeon? It just maybe can uh, give us some greater clarity on to who's in there and what happens to them and helps people understand why it's so important that, that we save the rest that are imprisoned and that we sanction these war criminals. Sure, so for the first question, um... Actually, some of the answer to that came into focus in the second half of my captivity. I was moved to a, to a large federal prison where I was immersed among thousands of other, <clears throat> of other Syrian inmates at a, at a federal prison called Adra on the outskirts of Damascus. And um, these men, uh, these men were some of the most remarkable people that I've, I've ever met in my life and, and, and I've actually been fortunate. I've traveled to every country in the world and I've experienced a lot of different people in different places. And what I learned very quickly is that virtually none of these men were true criminals, but instead just victims of a corrupt regime's criminal justice system. Many of them had been slugging their way through the prison system since the beginning of the revolution and had told me stories of um, being forced into confessions and being tortured and being, um, you know, just victims of these horrific circumstances. And I remember a couple weeks in, I, I asked, I asked one of them, you know, this is, this is, uh, you know, everybody here is so nice to me. I just a little bit hard to know what to expect in a place like this. And, and I'll never forget, he, he spoke pretty solid English. And he said to me, Sam, in Syria, all the good people are here in prison because all the bad people are outside putting us in here. This was a, a very sobering statement to absorb and I think provides a lot of context around just how these arbitrary detentions have been happening over the past you know, more than a decade in, in Syria. Thank you, Sam. And one last thing during your time, yeah, during your time in, in 215, could you just very briefly describe, at least from the sounds and from the daily routine of the guards and then the civilians that are being held in there, what goes on on a daily basis from your experience? Yeah, from my experience, um, one of my big struggles was that zero of the, the guards who I interacted with sp spoke any English at all. And so I had no communication. And Every day, it was usually in the morning and the evening, I would hear the sounds of these beatings and torture happening around me. And the guards would come down the line. They would go into the neighboring cells. I would hear these, these beatings. I would hear 
these these things happening in the in the the other inmates you know, screaming. And then the guards would come into my cell. They would just look, and then they would turn around and leave and go to the next one. And as I said, uh, you know, maybe it was you know maybe it was my you know my passport that saved me. Maybe they just um, didn't want to do anything that would then take the opportunity of releasing me off the table. Speculating there, I'm not sure, but um, that was a little bit of it gives a little bit of an idea of of, of what I experienced and um, you know just. In, in life, it puts a lot into perspective and just really happy to, to be here with, with all of you today. Thank you so much, Sam. And we're happy that you and Omar made it out. Um, I um, Just to, uh, ne next we wanna move to Ambassador Stephen Rapp, who's really been leading the legal efforts uh, for the Syrian Emergency Task Force and other organizations in pursuing both the war crimes documentation aspect and the pursuing of prosecutions and legal action, both in national courts uh, and, and other avenues that, that could be made possible since the International Criminal Court is not an option right now for Syria. And as he's done this throughout the years, I've, I've sort of witnessed uh, also, you know, how closely he has become uh, friends with Caesar uh, and, and how much working, um, you know, with our team, we've become custodians of the Caesar file. And it's the Caesar file in those places that are listed in those photos that have been sanctioned. In addition to Saidnaya, where, where Omar's advocacy and testimony before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and, and other place in the House Foreign Affairs Committee also shined light on that. And it's it's really powerful to see a, one positive step forward on this and sanctioning these uh, these intelligence branches. So I um, would love to hear from you, Ambassador Rapp, your thoughts in general over um, this latest development and anything else you would like to add. Well, thank you very much, Moaz, and it's an honor to join the others uh, in this press conference today. Um, yesterday was 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 very a very important day. Uh, it, it's been a long uh, time in coming, but that doesn't uh, diminish its significance because these crimes continue. Uh, I recall that it was it was actually seven years ago this week uh, that uh, SETF uh, uh, facilitated uh, the travel of, of Caesar to the United States of America to, to Washington D.C. and remember well on the, on the Friday uh, uh, when uh, when you Moaz uh, did the interpretation uh, uh, as he appeared before the Senate uh, uh, or excuse me the House Foreign Affairs Committee in his in his blue hoodie uh, with every single member um, listening uh, intently to that uh, uh, to his uh, to his testimony. Of course, our relationship with him had begun much earlier after after he came out and facilitating uh, his his safe relocation. And remember well, it was on Easter Sunday in in April uh, uh, when we took uh, when on behalf of the United States and the FBI we we took uh, a copy uh, custody of a copy of all of his photos uh, was delivered to us. And as people will recall, the FBI did a, a forensic analysis of data. Uh, the kind of thing that you can't uh, you can't uh, overcome uh, uh, if if uh, metadata is wrong if it's two photos if it's photoshopped and uh, and they concluded uh, that there were no artifices uh, no inconsistencies uh, that these photos uh, uh, represented real people and and real events and and what they clearly showed and of course there are fifty five thousand of them about twenty seven thousand of them are the numbered victims the victims that the regime itself numbered that they ordered people like Omar to to number uh, these corpses as they left uh, these facilities like uh, like 215 and 216 and 235 and 248 and, and their corpses uh, were delivered to military hospitals where Caesar and a team uh, job was to, to take photos uh, of, of each of them, uh, at least five photos and, and indeed his uh, his evidence shows that during uh, the period from late 2011 until he was able to get out of Syria in August of 2013 his group alone uh, uh, photographed about 11,000 uh, victims just by the numbering system. And his photos uh, uh, contain at least 6,800 individual men, women, and children uh, that, were, that were tortured to death by the, by, by the regime. Uh, we know that these crimes have, have continued. Obviously, uh, um, Sam and, and Omar are, are, are witness to that. Uh, indeed, in the German case, there was evidence uh, presented by the person who drove a refrigerator truck away uh, from uh, these military hospitals on until 2017, four years after and when he defected, uh, but for four more years, uh, each day uh, filling mass graves full of one, the tortured victims, the people that were emaciated, whose eyes were gouged out, who had uh, 
died of disease uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and starvation and, and, and active uh, uh, efforts uh, to, to destroy both their spirits and, and, and their bodies, uh, uh, corpses in, in, in horrible shape. And then also uh, the corpses of thousands of victims that were hanged as, as, as Omar was scheduled to be uh, in, in Sidnaya, uh, prisoners that came uh, uh, relatively clean and were part of that, uh, uh, of those dumps each time of hundreds of corpses, all of which has been verified uh, by, uh, by satellite photos. Uh, uh, so uh, it's, it's true that if you deal with identification and, and information that's been provided sometimes by the regime because information uh, was obtained through, uh, uh, through bribery of officials, we know at least 14,000 people tortured to death by this regime. But if you extrapolate it and, and look at, uh, at the evidence from the mass graves, it's, it's sadly north of, of, of 50,000 uh, men, women, and children that have been tortured to death. Uh, in, in the most horrendous uh, situations, and, and, and some hanged then uh, as well, um, that, uh, uh, that the commission of, of mass atrocities, mass torture, mass crimes against humanity, war crimes by this, by, by this regime. Uh, we also know that 130,000 individuals that can be identified are still missing uh, with no information, and maybe a third of them are in fact dead. They're in those mass graves, but in, there are tens of thousands of them uh, that are right now, as we speak, uh, living under uh, extreme duress in, in the worst possible situations known to humankind. And, and that's why it's so important that, uh, that this sanctions, uh, these sanctions be put into effect. Uh, uh, they were made possible by, of course, the Caesar Act. Uh, uh, it was his advocacy and the work of SETF and, and other groups that brought uh, uh, this uh, to Congress and, and, and pushed for it and finally succeeded in getting unanimous uh, approval of it in both uh, the House and Senate mandating uh, sanctions uh, on this regime. And, and, and today we see these sanctions specifically uh, on the officials of prisons. I would also note that whereas the, the Caesar photos tell us a lot about the, the victims and what happened to them, uh, we also have information from other groups like CJA and, and other groups that are based on, uh, that, that work with the Syrian uh, uh, victims and, and communities that have brought out information that has enabled the identification of, of the key regime officials uh, that are involved and that give us names uh, to, to specifically uh, sanction because obviously the prisoners uh, who themselves were in, uh, in, in, in darkened dungeons and, and often with hoods on their head uh, when these horrible uh, interrogations occurred, uh, don't identify the people that were above them in, in these prisons uh, uh, making this happen. Um, I would say as, as, as well, it, it's really important for Caesar. I just saw him a few days ago again in his, in his place of exile. It is a bit of an isolating life for him. He is safe uh, with his family. Uh, but uh, you know, the question that he always asks is having brought out uh, the, the best evidence, uh, as I've said, better than, than we had at Nuremberg because we didn't have numbered victims uh, done by the regime itself in the case of the, of the Nazis. Uh, where we actually had them taking pictures of, of the individual victims. <laughs> We've never seen that kind of thing before. Uh, but, uh, you know, disappointed that this hasn't led to more action. Uh, and, and, and indeed, uh, uh, Syrians continue now 11 years into this conflict to, uh, to feel abandoned uh, by the whole world. And, and at least this today or yesterday uh, signals that that, that abandonment uh, is, 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 I hope, coming to an end. Uh, it's not enough just to sanction individuals that are not likely to travel and they don't have uh, uh, bank accounts at, at Citibank in New York uh, to, to seize. Uh, it, it's symbolically important and it, it certainly sends a signal to them that, uh, that if they're, uh, they're hoping to, to visit uh, uh, their money or their whatever, or family members that they may have uh, uh, sent westward, uh, that they won't be able to do that. So I, I, want, I don't want to say this is, this is uh, not uh, effective. But it would be extremely important to, to do more in the prosecution area. Of course, in Germany, using, using universal jurisdiction and with the help of the Caesar photos, which was the key evidence, uh, with a, a great many victims and, and insiders uh, testifying, we've already had a conviction of one of the individuals involved in, in, in the torture. Another, uh, the trial continues against the second individual who faces a life sentence uh, because of uh, his leadership of the interrogations and torture. Uh, in Unit 251, which is one of the units uh, uh, that are today uh, sanctioned or yesterday sanctioned by the, uh, by the United States government. 
Um, that trial should finish by the end of the year, and, and we think, given the evidence, uh, very likely uh, with a conviction. Uh, I was pleased, uh, though it's not directly on point, but it's certainly the kind of thing we hear from all of the survivors, to see that the Germans moved forward yesterday uh, in indicting a doctor, a Syrian doctor who had pretended to be a victim, where in fact he was the most sadistic doctor you can imagine. And, and uh, like many victims have told us that when they were in serious ill health and they were sent to hospitals from, from these dungeons, they were treated worse in the hospitals than they were in the dungeons by, by, by sadly doctors. And this is one of those angels of death uh, that, um, that operated in Homs uh, in, in the military hospital there. And, and according to the allegations and evidence uh, committed horrendous uh, uh, crimes and, and injury and, 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 and delivered death. Uh, to, to innocent Syrians. So he will soon go on trial in Germany as well. Uh, it's of course not enough that Germany do this, other countries need to pitch in and, uh, and, and uh, to some extent our laws in the United States aren't as strong as, as, uh, as, as they should be. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a patchwork of statutes that's not very comprehensive. Uh, uh, when I was talking uh, to another torture victim, uh, our friend Kevin Dawes, uh, uh, he was uh, tortured over a period of, of five years, and uh, under our U.S. torture law, um, when you torture an American, that's not a crime in the United States. Uh, it, it's not a crime unless you can prove that it was associated with the war. Now, I, I think we've got a connection there that could open the way to prosecution, but we clearly need to improve our statutes and make sure uh, that when American citizens uh, are, 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 are subject to atrocities or when perpetrators are present uh, in our jurisdiction or present in another country where we can extradite them from, that we've got the ability to prosecute those cases as well. And we need to, in the, in the, with the blockage of the Security Council, uh, do more in, in cooperation uh, with other countries to pool our jurisdiction, to pool our, our resources, uh, to, to make sure that it's not just three or four cases that are charged, but that dozens of individuals uh, face trial. And so the real prospect of, of justice uh, is, is out there and that that uh, ensures us that whatever happens in Syria, and, and, and of course this war is not over, Assad has not won and he will not win, uh, but whatever happens, uh, that there will be justice and it will be impossible to, uh, to sweep these horrendous crimes uh, under the rug. Uh, and, and, and indeed, uh, I think that was probably the most important thing yesterday uh, with these crimes uh, having gained a great deal of notice in the past and less so in the, in, in the uh, recently uh, that uh, with the action of uh, President Biden and the State Department and the Treasury Department, uh, it's clearly been a signal uh, that these victims are not forgotten, but more, much more needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Rapp, for, for these insightful comments. And, and it's surreal, you know, we, we've been working on this now for 10 years. Um, and, you, you know, you listen back to what's unfolding and what's happening. It, it is a reminder of the worst moments of history. And I think it shows that, first of all, these are positive steps. They are applauded and encouraged and we need more. But, but that's the point is we need a lot more work because when there's something on this scale of humanitarian atrocities that are happening, um, I feel like, you know, the, the, all of the world needs to know and, 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 and there needs to be a leadership that brings these atrocities to, to an end. And now I want to just give an opportunity to, to some of our um, other participants on the call to ask questions of Sam, Omar, or Ambassador Stephen Rapp um, regarding these sanctions, other developments in Syria, or, or whatever is on your mind. So, um, Maybe uh, if anyone would, has any questions, just feel free to, to hop in or maybe raise your hand and, and we can call on you either way works. But uh, please, uh, if any of our colleagues, especially from the press that have joined us today, have any questions, uh, feel free to do so. If there are no questions, I can. Uh, I know that we want to keep this to maybe 45 minutes to, to an hour, but I think we just got a question now uh, for any or all panelists uh, from Josh Rogan, who is a columnist at the Washington Post and is often uh, on CNN as well. Um, here is what should the Biden administration be doing to affect the outcome of the conflict? Uh, what are the three to four concrete things that Biden, that the Biden team 
could do now to change Assets calculus. And I'm happy to take a crack at this, but before I do, um, if Sam, Omar, or Ambassador Rab, would you you'd like to comment on that question, feel free. I'll, I'll let you go first. I, I want to add an accountability point, but uh, you can talk Absolutely. about the situation on the ground sure. to a greater extent. So we're looking at Syria, I think it's a great question. And and we and, and, and unfortunately, there has not been a, a clear strategy by the Biden administration of what should happen in Syria. Um, although we are hopeful that this administration will do the right thing and do what the two previous administrations failed to do, which is bring uh, a resolution to this conflict and, and, and namely end the killing in Syria, which is conducive to a negotiated settlement. I think it's really important. Um, you know, we, we see this this small step of, of of these sanctions based on the Caesar file and the law and, and Omar's experience in Said Naya. That's a positive step. We have seen the Biden administration bring up the issue of cross-border humanitarian aid in President Biden's meeting with, with Putin. Um, I know that there was this short sort of six-month extension, but that's again a small victory that we'll take because that would have starved five million people in northwest Syria. Um, but so far, we remain in a policy review um, that has, has been stated by the administration. The policy review, according to the State Department in our conversations with them, isn't to change the policy, but it is to figure out what strategies um, the administration wants to pursue to reach uh, the policy goals uh, that, that, are, that have been stated. Um, but it's really, quite honestly, sort of we're, we're rudderless in terms of who's driving Syria policy um, in the administration. It's, it's kind of unclear if it's the National Security Council or the State Department. There isn't an envoy um, that is on, on, on the deserving profile of, of this horrific conflict. For example, you know, our vision would be to have a senior Syria envoy, the likes of of Gates or Holbrook or others, people that show that the United States is back at the table and is aiming uh, with a clear strategy to resolve the situation in Syria. So that being said, um, right now, what should the Biden administration do? What are the three to four things that they can do in terms of Syria? I think number one, we need to finalize this policy review and have a very clear policy and strategy for Syria. There needs to be uh, uh, also someone that is guiding that policy, whether that is the Secretary of State or, or an, uh, an envoy or somebody else, that needs to be clear. We need to be back at the table. And if you look at Syria right now, you see that although everyone goes out and says in public statements, there is no military solution to this conflict, there's only a political solution. Well, that's fair. That's what we all want to see. We want to see a political solution. But the fact is currently today in Syria, there is one solution it's a military solution. It is that of Russia, Iran, the Assad regime, Hezbollah, and allied militias and terrorist organizations. And they believe that they have a blank check to continue to utilize chemical weapons, torture people to death, have horrific strangling sieges, whether it's on Rukban or now Dar al Balad. Um, and they believe that if that they have the green light by the international community, due to the fact that the world has turned away for these last 10 years, to detain, displace, or kill those that remain in opposition to them. Remember, 14 million people in Syria have been displaced between refugees and internally displaced. That's more than half the country originally of about 23 million people. The number of deaths probably has surpassed a million. The United Nations stopped counting at half a million. And by conservative estimates, we're looking at 130 to 250,000 men, women, and children in these horrific concentration camps, dungeons, whatever you want to call them, in this machinery of death of the detention system there. But in Northwest Syria, where the Syrian Emergency Task Force uh, and has operated now for 10 years, where we have the Wisdom House School for Orphans and the Women's Center, where we have these amazing Syrians from all over the country that are now sort of escaping Assad into the last bastion of opposition uh, holdout in Northwest Syria, namely in Idlib province, you have the final obstacle for the Assad regime, Iran and Russia to get the military victory that they want. 
And what does it mean for them to, to get that military victory? It means there will be impunity and the road to accountability will be much more difficult. It means no refugees will return. It means potentially the doubling of uh, Syrian refugees in Europe, which is by no means good for the European continent and very good for Russia's interests. It means this buffer zone of Northwest Syria uh, and this distraction for Iran, Russia, and the Assad regime goes away and they zero in on the US presence, strategic and important presence in Northeast Syria and in Rukban, uh, focused on the fight against ISIS. It means mass atrocities against civilians that dwarf what we've seen in Dara and Aleppo and Homs and Hama. Uh, and it means the empowerment of extremists that will then utilize and take advantage of these horrific crimes and uh, turn the blind eye of the international community to also mobilize and, and reconstitute. And, and we may see a resurgence of ISIS in places like the Northeast, where we have had such a success working with our partner forces in order to defeat the territorial caliphate. And it means that the negotiated settlement or a political solution is completely off the table because it means that the Assad regime can then declare victory. And in doing so, entrench Syria into, as uh, Ambassador Hoff said at one of SCTF's um, uh, events recently, a, a North Korea of the Middle East. That is where we are right now. And what the Biden administration in coordination with our allies can do is simply take away the military solution and the military victory of the Assad regime in order to make a reality, a political settlement and a negotiated settlement to the conflict. And the way to do that, short of further deployment of US troops and short of direct US military involvement, uh, we believe involves a three-pronged approach. And I encourage everyone uh, to reach out to us and get our Idlib report, which describes that. We believe Idlib is the last hope for a negotiated settlement and for the revolution. Because the millions of people there that are from Idlib and the millions of others from every other part of Syria that have refused to become refugees and are willing to live under bombardment and napalm, white phosphorus, and all the different horrific weapons that have been used against them, uh, because they are just so such resilient people and we must stand by them. And to do that, it's a three-pronged approach. One, we need to focus all existing executive orders and uh, on top of that, the Caesar Serious Civilian Protection Act uh, on sanctioning anyone associated with Iran, Russia, IRGC, Hezbollah, the Assad regime that are right now amassing around uh, Northwest Syria, where you have an ever shrinking space for 4 million civilians, a million of them children. Uh, and in utilize these sanctions to as much as possible, lower their capacity and ability to fuel this war against civilians that will result in all the horrible consequences I just described. That's the economic approach. On the political and diplomatic side, we working with our European allies and working with Turkey, who we may not ag agree on, on sometimes uh, the way they're going with some domestic policy issues or maybe some actions that happen in Northeast Syria. But when it comes to Northwest Syria, Turkey, the Europeans in the United States have the same interest, which is don't allow massive refugee displacement, protect the civilians there, because that's what keeps alive a political solution. Otherwise, Assad can just declare victory uh, and, and, and Syria goes into a black hole. And so a clear public statement by the Europeans, the Turks, and the United States saying that attacks against civilians in, Turk, in Idlib province in Northwest Syria will not be to tolerated, that massive uh, massacres and atrocities and massive displacement will not be tolerated. I think that's a very important public policy and, and diplomatic position to have. Uh, and to have a clear statement on that. And I think the question then beyond the economic sanctions in this political or diplomatic uh, position that could be taken alongside our allies on this will be, well, what's the what if? What if they continue to attack civilians? And I think this, the final prong of, of this strategy that the Biden administration uh, and its allies must move forward on is to utilize and take advantage of the fact that there are 11,000 NATO troops from Turkey that are today in uh, Northwest Syria. And uh, if we go back in time about a year or so ago, we see the beginning of this existing ceasefire that is now being breached and the violence now being escalated that we need to ensure continues. And how do you keep the ceasefire? Well, the reason the ceasefire came into place is because a NATO ally had gone in 
uh, and and intervened to stop the 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 offensive by Russia, Iran, and the Assad regime, but did that alone. And at that time, a quarter of the province was this was taken by the Assad regime. As a matter of fact, in a, in literally a week, 500,000 families, including our school for orphans, our women's center, and our staff, were displaced further north. But if the United States diplomatically and economically supports the efforts of, uh, alongside our European allies of Turkey, especially its presence in Northwest Syria. And we at least start military to military conversations, provide at least Intel support only in specifically having to do with going after Hezbollah, Iran, uh, and the Assad regime in Northwest Syria. We believe that this three-pronged approach, again, short of direct military intervention or any further deployment of US troops, um, can help us ensure that this ceasefire that this ceasefire becomes permanent. And when it does, when the Assad regime and its allies understand that they can't kill, detain, displace, and bomb their way to a complete territorial victory in Syria, that is when they will be forced to a political solution. I'll just stop there and let if my colleagues wanted to add anything to, to that, please feel free. Well, let me, let me just jump in uh, briefly. Uh, uh, first of all, it's, it's essential that there be no normalization uh, of, of relations uh, with Assad and that we should discourage other countries uh, from that route as well. Uh, I mean, periodically one hears that, you know, of, of countries like Greece, uh, countries like the UAE establishing uh, relations. Uh, and, and I think um, as much as one wants to uh, open discussions, uh, uh, the, the signal that that sends is that eventually uh, uh, Assad will be rehabilitated and it'll be possible for uh, him to reward his cronies and himself by rebuilding Syria uh, on the property of, of people that they've tortured to death, uh, that that is the wrong signal. It, it, the signal has to be no normalization, no assistance. Anyone that helps rebuild uh, this regime is guilty of complicity in war crimes. And, and they'll be prosecuted for that or they'll be prosecuted for uh, uh, for uh, uh, actions uh, counter to, to, to sanctions. And, and that has to be a solid position. The, the Assad cannot enjoy the fruits of, of a victory. And, and that needs to be our, our consistent position. And frankly, when we've taken that kind of position with other regimes, uh, uh, eventually those leaders have proven uh, um, inconvenient to even their own cronies. And, and, and they've been set aside and we've seen how uh, Assad himself has had to uh, enter into fights within his own family uh, 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 with, with those whose assets he's trying to get. And so his position uh, isn't as strong as, as, as we may think. So that's an important part of it. Uh, but the other part of it is, is, is the criminal investigation and, and, and accountability. And, and as much as I'd like to see a pooled jurisdiction court where the United States and other countries pool their jurisdiction, and, and, and prosecute the high-level actors, uh, that's certainly my first preference. But at least as a, as a step toward that, we should have a, a proactive uh, joint investigative team uh, with, with our allies. Uh, there are, of course, uh, investigations being done through the United Nations. There's this in, uh, international mechanism uh, in, uh, uh, in Geneva that collates information from groups like CJA and from civil society organizations. Uh, but both for the, the civil society organizations and for, uh, uh, for this mechanism in Geneva, they're responding usually to requests uh, from most countries for relatively low level individuals, usually, uh, 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 usually uh, alleged jihadists, uh, not that those aren't serious crimes, but 90% uh, of the crimes committed according to every analyst uh, in, in Syria. And the reason that the, the jihadists have, have been able to succeed where they have is because of the regime. <laughs> And, and so uh, it really is important to be able to proactively uh, investigate and, and define which country uh, can do uh, the, the highest level actor available. And also I see Josh's uh, second question, which deals with, with assets. Uh, I don't think anybody at this point knows of any assets that any of these five individual uh, prison administrators or, or military intelligence leaders uh, or officers uh, um, have. I just want to uh, know Western it's, it's it's yeah. Ali Rogan from PBS News Hours question. Oh, I think sorry, there's some sorry. relation. Ah, oh, but, wrong, no wrong. problem. <laughs> Let me give you credit, Ali. <laughs> not, uh, not two from Josh. Okay, that would have been greedy on his part. But thank you, Ali, for that for that question. But I think that what what re what really needs is proactive investigation of the financial connections, of the uh, enabling companies, 
of, of, the, of the shadowy accounts, of, of those sorts of things. Uh, and, 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 uh, and then uh, those kinds of things are much more likely uh, to lead to prosecutions in Western countries and, and to finding some assets or finding somebody uh, who facilitated. Uh, we remember that PNB, uh, BNP Paribas, uh, the French bank, uh, ended up paying $9 billion in, in fines uh, uh, because it facilitated transactions uh, with, uh, uh, with Bashir in, uh, uh, in, in Sudan, uh, contrary to US sanctions. So there are ways that you can get at this, but it takes a high level investigation in which we share our information and do it in the proactive way that we do when we when we investigate organized crime, for instance, and this is very high level organized crime uh, uh, led by a major international uh, war criminal, the worst of our century, uh, um, al Assad. Thank you, Ambassador Rapp. And, and that is a good question um, uh, by Ali uh, Rogan with PBS News that were about sort of the assets outside the country. And just to add to what Ambassador Rapp said, and perhaps Omar, you might want to comment on this. You know, one thing that we try to do is also constantly identify um, what are the, the shell companies, the front companies, the different uh, entities in places like Eastern Europe or, or other places that the Assad regime, which has become a veteran of evading sanctions, um, that are the, what are they utilizing in order for us to to make sure that we go after these assets? And one way is, you know, it's important to identify them for potential civil cases and so on, as Ambassador Rapp said. Um, also important to identify them to help sort of plug in these loopholes that continue to fuel this war machine. And since the beginning of the of the implementation of the Caesar Act, working um, with different groups, including uh, advisors from FDB and, and others, we've tried to do all we can to provide the right research and information um, to US authorities to ensure that we are plugging in these loopholes and that um, these sanctions are going after um, uh, these top war criminals and, and officials that are fueling this war. But uh, Omar, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to, to that question. Briefly, before maybe we take Elizabeth question, um, I think, so Assad regime is aware that, you know, um, more companies, more nations are afraid from doing any, any business with them or supporting them um, because of the sanctions. And so the Assad regime obviously going under the table with the organizations with different name or uh, breaking under the table, if we say it clearly, um, especially from, from, um, from Greece. But what we need to do is we actually need to get help as much as what possible from the Syrian communities around Europe. Because they can be, we, we have so much resources that, we, that we're not using. Uh, we, we've been obviously being, you know, you know tips by many, uh, many Syrians. Well, this organization is doing this and this organization is doing this and they're smuggling this to Syria. We probably need to build a mechanism uh, so we can actually, you know, uh, get everybody who have a little bit of information to give this information and we can store it and we can verify it uh, because that would be really helpful because there are Syrians everywhere uh, in the world, unfortunately, and fortunately yeah, at the same time. Um, so we have to, to, to use that, uh, these resources uh, that's really not structured. So if we can structure them, if we can manage to build a system that can collect data from all those people uh, about what they know, what they think uh, is true. And so then we can filter this information and put more, you know, pitch more people, uh, push more names, companies to be sanctioned uh, and, you know, you know, um, prevent any normalization with the Syrian regime. Um, do the, to the time, Moaz, if you take Elizabeth's question. Uh, that would yeah, be I great. do. I want to, maybe this could be the last question because we want to try to keep it to an hour. And, and this has been um, really productive and, and, and efficient considering we, we sort of planned it at the last minute. But Elizabeth, I think with, um, with Al Monitor, um, you've been covering Syria very closely. If you have a question, please feel free and we can conclude with that. Hi, yeah, thanks so much for doing this. Um, I'm, I'm hoping you can talk about where you'd like to see the Biden administration's uh, sanctions policy in Syria go next. Um, yesterday's sanctions were human rights focused. So I'm wondering um, with the Caesar law, is there room to pick up with where the prior administration left off and, and more forcefully target the regime's financial backers? Yeah, I'll just say very briefly and, and, and maybe uh, see if Sam, uh, Ambassador Rapp or Omar would like to add. Um, we have not seen any sanctions under the Caesar Act uh, 
under this uh, under President Biden's administration yet. And so we we you know with the Caesar Act, this is a bill that is inspired by survivors like Omar and by witnesses like Caesar. It was uh, it's a bipartisan legislation that really focused on being able to go after. Um, the financial systems of the regime, the war criminals, uh, et cetera, at the same time taking uh, extreme caution to ensure that all the humanitarian exceptions that needed to be there are there to ensure that we don't hurt uh, civilians, regardless of their political outlook, uh, by these sanctions. And we believe that too little has been done. I mean, obviously, there have been no new sanctions under the Caesar Act. That needs to happen right away. Um, I think it is also a no-brainer, first of all, that even on the human rights side, every single security branch and security apparatus of the Assad regime must be sanctioned. There is no good intelligence branch in Syria. There is no good uh, military commander that's that's uh, allowing helicopters to drop barrel bombs uh, in Syria. Um, and those other factions, whether it's Iran or Russia and their allied militias in the country, all under Caesar can and must be sanctioned. In addition, of course, to sanctioning the, the efforts to rebuild um, areas where people have been displaced, slaughtered, massacred, homes and properties taken away, uh, be reconstructed in exchange for diplomatic uh, recognition uh, or be reconstructed to allow different demographics to take place that goes along with Iran's strategy of really changing the demographics and ethnically cleansing certain parts of Syria for their own national security priorities, which is to destabilize the region and to threaten our allies in the region and, and to control Syria as, as they do now. And so there is a long long way and there is a long list of, uh, uh, of, of institutions, individuals, intelligence branches, military commanders, um, mercenaries like the Wagner Group or, or, or Iranian-backed militias and, and others that are taking part in the wholesale slaughter of civilians in Syria. And so we believe that the administration should be going after each one of these avenues. It should go after uh, the financiers of the war machine. It should go after those who sell fuel uh, and uh, for, for the helicopters and tanks that are killing civilians and now amassing around Idlib and Dara. Um, it should go after the heads of every intelligence branch and every intelligence, intelligence apparatus across Syria. And all of these sanctions are the very least that we can do, but they should be done uh, in, with, with a wider strategy um, that, is, that, that should be adopted by the US uh, and its allies in order to finally bring an end to this horrendous war against civilians, not a civil war, but, but a peaceful revolution that came out and then was met with horrific brutality and, and a situation that became increasingly complex. But for the civilians in Syria, it's, it's quite simple. They demanded their dignity, human rights, and freedom and liberty and, and the world turned away and they still deserve those rights. So I think focusing on all the different sectors from financial to the reconstruction slash diplomatic recognition of the Assad regime, as Ambassador mentioned, and on normalization, to going after the intelligence branches and the military apparatus and the security apparatus that is literally killing, displacing, and detaining and torturing to death civilians. Um, but uh, Ambassador Rapp, uh, Omar, and Sam, if you'd like to add your comments before we wrap up. If I, if I can say a final word before I go, um, start heading to, to my flight, uh, sanctions, um, symbolic sanctions like the ones we we, we seen yesterday um, are very important. Uh, they are really good. Uh, it's obviously more important with sanctions that has real effect, uh, straight effect on companies, individuals that supporting the same regime. And uh, the sanctions yet has not from the Caesar Act has not been uh, not enough. We need more, and especially on Lebanon. Uh, that, that it's the heart of the same regime. The, the regime is getting everything through Lebanon and Iran. Uh, so if we can find a way uh, and the names to, to sanction uh, the Lebanese entities and the individuals, organizations that supporting the regime and making it easier for the regime to get what they, what, what they want from oil or uh, whatever weapons they need, uh, that, would, that would be great without harming the Lebanese people who are suffering um, been suffering for years, but especially after the the, the recent uh, the recent events. Thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you, Omar. And thanks, Elizabeth, for that question. Sam uh, or Ambassador Rav, if you'd like to add to uh, anything, closing yeah. remarks or answering Elizabeth. Yeah. Yeah, just real quick closing remark. Um, I, I was just going to say that uh, as with uh, Moaz and Omar uh, for sure, and I believe Ambassador Rav as well. 
I'm, I've been fortunate to, to develop a lot of friendships with the Syrian people. And I think sometimes here in the United States, um, you know, what's happening in Syria can feel very distant when it's geographically far away or on a TV screen or on a computer screen. And, and, um, and it, it, I just wanna, it's it just, I think it's worth reminding everyone that these are just real people that are truly some of the best people in the world. And it's just uh, completely unacceptable what they've um, had to, to go through over the past decade and now 11 years. And so thank you all for, for being here and uh, taking the time to, to raise awareness for what's going on. Thank you, Omar, and Ambassador Rapp. Yeah, yeah, just finally, in terms of other Sam. people to sanction, uh, I just I had something on my phone about an event in which I'll participate three weeks from uh, Saturday uh, that commemorates the eighth anniversary of the horrendous uh, uh, sarin gas attack on East Gouda that, that killed uh, 1,500 men, women, and children. We still remember those horrendous pictures of, 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 of children uh, uh, you know, uh, dying, uh, gasping their last breaths. And uh, um, not enough justice uh, for that crime yet. Um, and um, fortunately, there are prosecutions going forward in Germany and in France, and Germany under universal jurisdiction in France because of uh, there, there was a, a French citizen uh, a surviving victim in Escuda. Uh, but also the, the companies, the precursor chemicals, those that have uh, provided the scientific advice, uh, there are additional individuals and, and companies that, that do need to be sanctioned uh, and that could be prosecuted as some have been already in Belgium. Uh, so that's another area where we get directly at, at the war crimes. Uh, I, I think that uh, I'm, I tend to be more of a hawk on this question of economic support that uh, uh, engineering companies and construction companies that are rebuilding uh, Syria on property stolen from, uh, uh, from people that are tortured to death. Uh, uh, as provided in the Caesar Act, uh, those those need to be sanctioned. Uh, the question of the central bank was one that that hasn't yet been decided in terms of it being a money laundering outfit, concern about destroying the whole currency and undermining a humanitarian situation uh, is 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 very genuine. But uh, uh, carefully done, we we need to get to the the ways this government uh, continues to survive, uh, uh, even uh, as it as it kills its own people and and. And, and displaces uh, more than more than half of them. Uh, if we're really going to be serious, and 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 since we're not going to commit uh, any forces on the ground, we've got to use every other tool in the toolbox. Thank you so much, Ambassador Rapp. And I want to thank our colleagues from the Washington Post, C Post, CNN, El Monitor, PBS NewsHour, and others that joined us today. Um, and I want to thank Ridgely Walsh for helping us put this important press conference together. Um, I think it's very important. And please know you can follow up with our communications director, Celeste, who's also on this call, or with any one of us if you have any further questions going forward. And we'll be uh, reaching out soon as we go through uh, meetings through this week and in potential events, including the commemoration of that horrific chemical weapons attack that uh, Ambassador Rapp mentioned coming up um, in August uh, when we did very little um, to, to hold them accountable for that or, or stop further chemical weapons attacks that unfortunately happens many times after that major attack. Thank you all very much for your time um, and uh, look forward to connecting again soon. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.